Welcome to the Allen Sack National Symposium, Advancing Integrity in College Sport. We come to you from the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. The topic, the Drake Group National Awards, a vision for the future. The Drake Group Presidential Award is presented to Sedona Prince. The award honors an extraordinary contribution by an individual who has helped advance the integrity of intercollegiate athletics through an, an articulate and well-reasoned response to a current event or important issue. Sedona's advocacy and activism changed the future of NCAA women's basketball and ignited a comprehensive review of the treatment of female athletes at all NCAA championship events. Her TikTok exposure of inferior female in, uh, treatment of, of females compared to male athletes participating in the w men's and women's 2021 Final Four tournaments revealed gender inequities in a way that could be instantly understood. The American public was educated about the significant disparities in food, gifts, COVID testing, weight training equipment, and the way inadequate promotions and marketing disadvantaged women athletes. Her clearly stated concerns ignited an independent and highly transparent NCAA gender equity review that encompassed all NCAA championships. As a result, the NCAA announced that it would use March Madness branding for both the men's and women's 2022 Division I tournaments, and the women's tournament was expanded to 68 teams, same as the men. Sedona's generosity and intentionality in the use of her notoriety, educating millions of millions of her followers on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter, social media platforms, and her hosting of more than an athlete hotline varsity edition on the uninterrupted YouTube channel to discuss issues that transcend basketball have constituted significant contributions. She embraced becoming a role model for female athletes, learning to navigate the new NIL marketplace by successfully pursuing endorsement and merchandising opportunities. The Drake Group applauds Sedona Prince as an impressive example of an athlete using her voice and the media spotlight as a social justice champion working for the greater good. Sedona, unfortunately, is out of the country and unable to join us. Our next award is the Drake Group 2022 Student Journalism Prize for Investigative Reporting on Intercollegiate Athletics. It was presented last week to, univers to, to University of Minnesota student Jessica Jersick by Drake member Michael Shu, a former University of Minnesota regent, for her article on the consequences of cutting indoor track. This prize recognizes the print, video, or multimedia work of a graduate or undergraduate college student journalist for exceptional substantive investigative reporting on intercollegiate athletics. The work must address an issue related to the protection of college athletes, financial excess, academic integrity, ethical conduct, racist or sexist practices, treatment of a whistleblower, or similar concern. Ms. Jersick's reporting on the University of Minnesota's announcement that the men's indoor track program would be eliminated revealed the importance of track and field to black athletes who don't play football or basketball, and the track and field is a low-cost sport that provides a major avenue to college for minority athletes. The story takes a deep dive into the subject and raises questions the university must answer, such as how does eliminating a low-cost program that offers advantages to so many help, a, help erase an athletic program deficit that may reach $75 million? Hi, my name is Jessica Jersik. I just graduated from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities with a degree in professional journalism. I'm really appreciative to the Drake Group for presenting me with this award um, for my story about um, the attempt to cut men's track at the University of Minnesota. I think it's really important to tell student athletes stories, particularly those that extend beyond their performances on the track or the field or wherever they may be, um, and really focusing on the details and the stories that have big implications for their lives um, outside of athletics as well. Once again, I'm so appreciative to the Drake Group for this award. Thank you so much. On this 
50th anniversary of Title IX, the Drake Group awarded a special Title IX Student Journalism Prize for investigative reporting to 19, to 19 student journalists from the Shirley Povich Center for Sports Journalism and the Howard Center for Investigative Journalism at the University of Maryland. I asked Alexandra Gopin, a member of the journalism team who just graduated from the University of Maryland in December, to join me as I tell you about the work of the group. Alexandra? Unlevel Playing Fields was an extraordinary work involving 19 student journalists, 13 editors, and 13 other students and faculty contributing data, digital design, and graphics, photography, fact-checking, and audience engagement. They conducted a four-month investigation of Title IX and high school sports, revealing a system that is failing countless girls. The investigation showed that boys are favored over girls in many ways, playing on better fields, wearing nicer uniforms, and receiving greater publicity from their schools. The work consists of 12 text stories, several video pieces, and a national poll of high school parents and their student athletes to measure awareness of Title IX. Okay. I am now pleased to introduce the Honorable. No, no, no. Nope. Hmm? Oh, sorry. Very sorry. Please. Thank you. Um, I should be standing up here with 18 other incredible student journalists, uh, but they're actually at commencement for the Philip Merrill College of Journalism right about now. Um, First, I want to thank the Drake Group for granting Unlevel Playing Fields this award. I'm so grateful to be accepting this award on behalf of the whole team um, after months of research about Title IX compliance in high school sports. Um, I also want to thank my professor and editor, Mark Hyman, who's sitting right here, um, because this project wouldn't exist without his valiant efforts to tackle such an important issue. Uh, what struck me most as I was interviewing many students and parents this year was how little awareness there is um, in high schools about the rights Title IX guarantees to women and girls in sports. Uh, parents and students agree that they want boys and girls to receive the same treatment, uh, but I think it's about time that girls are made aware of the rights they're entitled to under law. Uh, this project does exactly that. It brings awareness to a crucial topic that doesn't get the attention it deserves. So thank you again to the Drake Group for recognizing our work with such an honor and for bringing attention to a topic that affects the lives of young women and girls every day. Thank you. And now, I am pleased uh, to introduce the Honorable Rosa DeLauro, Congresswoman for the 3rd District of Connecticut, who will announce the Alan Sachs Symposium commemoration. Hello, this is Congress. Hello, this is Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro, representing Connecticut's 3rd Congressional District. I want to thank President-elect Dr. Andy Zimplist for those kind words and generous introduction. Let me also recognize my former colleague and dear friend, Congressman Tom McMillan, who will present a commemorative plaque and an American flag that was flown from the U.S. Capitol in honor of Dr. Alan Sack. But first, it is my pleasure to announce the commemoration of the naming of this symposium in honor of my constituent, Dr. Alan Sack. For nearly 50 years, Alan and his wife, Gina, 
have been residents of my hometown, New Haven. It is where they raised their two sons, Aaron and Ethan, and where Alan taught for more than four decades at the University of New Haven. I wish I could be there in person to celebrate with Alan, his friends, family, and colleagues on this very special occasion, but I am humbled to have been asked to announce tonight's commemoration of the Alan Sack National Symposium on Advancing Integrity in College Athletics. For over 40 years, Dr. Sack has been nationally recognized a leader for his efforts to protect higher education from the negative influences of high, highly commercialized college sports programs. His persistent efforts have challenged higher education to plug the holes in the integrity dike. Moreover, his efforts have been characterized by an unshakable commitment to good scholarship and dependence on research, supported data. But most of all, Dr. Sack has consistently espoused his love for the potential of collegiate athletes to deliver a meaningful education and profound development experiences to those who play. As you all know, Dr. Sack is an extraordinary educator, and through his leadership of the Drake Group over the years, his advocacy has helped educate countless members of Congress and higher education leaders from across the country. His work has resulted in the development of a national policy that aims to protect the health and well-being of all of our college athletes. And I know I speak for all of us when I say Dr. Sack has earned our gratitude, respect, and this tremendous honor. So I want to thank you again for inviting me to join you tonight and giving me the opportunity to extend my sincere appreciation of Dr. Sack's work on behalf of generations of college athletes. With that, please join me in welcoming and congratulating Dr. Alan Sack. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Tom McMillan, a former colleague of Congressman DeLora. I want to thank her very much for presenting this flag that flew over the Capitol and a certificate oh attesting to that, and um, as well as this plaque uh, from the Drake Group to you, oh, yeah. and honored to have a chance to uh, have you here as the co-founder of the Drake Group, and I know you want to say a few words about the future of college honor. sports. Your, my God, you're, you're bigger than I ever thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> True. It came in handy in my previous life, so thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, Congresswoman De 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 uh, Delora is not here, but I would like to thank her uh, for her many very, very kind words, very flattering. My God, that's a wonderful statement. Uh, and she has served with distinction in Connecticut's third district for 31 years. And she's worked tireless to make the world a better place. Drake Group members are proud to have uh, her in attendance at this symposium. She's not at the, but that's a hell of a way to be attendant uh, symposium. And thank you very much for fitting us into her busy schedule. It's not easy for these people to get away at all. And for her to go out of the way as she did to do this, I am really, really kind of moved. <laughs> that's really great. Now, good afternoon to turn my attention to, to you guys. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome all of you to the Allen Sachs Symposium, Advancing Academic Integrity in College Sport. Honestly, I never dreamed there would be a symposium named after me. I thought those, those uh, awards were only given to people who are famous or who have already passed away. I, I said that to my, to my brother. <laughs> yeah, but I'm still here. Uh, happily, I fit neither category, so go figure. Uh, I've been a member of the Drake Group since its inception in 1999. I started off, 
I started off as a ragtag group. Oh, we did. The Drake group started off as a ragtag group of, of activists, sometimes marching in the streets to bring about reform in collegiate athletics. In 2003, for instance, Drake Group President Linda Benzel Myers, she's not here, is she, by any chance? Linda's not here. Tremendous uh, working with her. She suggested that we hold a protest demonstration in San Antonio, um, the site of the NCAA's Final Four. This sounded like a great idea, especially after uh, a couple of beers. Uh, so we thought we would do this. This sounded like a great idea. So we made signs listing all four major proposals, traveled to San Antonio, and walked back and forth in front of the Hyatt where the Division I basketball coaches were staying. Washington Post writer Liz Clark, is she here by any chance? No, she was there at that, at that particular uh, activist activity. Liz Clark, who covered the, the event, described us as quote unquote uh, graying university professors trying to sell something radical uh, amid the, the basketball craze marketplace, that product they are pushing, wrote Clark, is education. And back then she was talking about graying, now we barely have our hair left. But. Uh, I remember this one very, very much from that event. Bruce, uh, Drake Group member Bruce Fauré carried a protest uh, Com compared our protest to a Michael Moore documentary. At one point, I saw Sfare, picket sign in hand, chasing Syracuse coach Joe Byham down the sidewalk to get his views on five-year no-cut scholarships. Um, I remember his picket sign getting stuck in the hotel's revolving doors, allowing by 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 B Bayham to escape. That really happened. We were sitting there watching, and, and this my friend of mine is chasing Bayham across the state. And he's got his, <laughs> he gets stuck in the, in the revolving doors. I must admit that in its early days, the, the Drake Group spent more time focusing on deficiencies in big-time college sports than on developing a vision of what college sport could be at its very best. And that's true. We spent our time really. I think it was important doing that. Uh, there was something, oh yeah, I was going to say this, this is important. The protest was a great success. NCAA President Miles Brand wrote a column in the New York Times saying the Drakes were incorrigible cynics who wanted to end university support for college athletics. Go figure. We had no idea. We couldn't understand that, but it didn't matter. What we, uh, what we said made no sense, but what he said made no sense, but we appreciate it uh, being mentioned in the New York Times. In other words, our main goal then was to be recognized by mass media, just to be on the board somewhere or other, right? So anyway, we have a, a little bit of a critique of that. I must admit that in the early years, the Drake Group spent more time focusing on the deficiencies of big time college sport than on developing a vision of what college sport could be in the, at, the very, at its very best. At a series of meetings not long ago, maybe a month or so ago, at the Drake Group. The Drake Group spent uh, considerable time discovering and following, uh, following vision, discovering the following vision that I'm going to read about uh, for college sports. All right, so I, I think I was being criticized at that, at that uh, meeting, that particular meeting, for being kind of in the back years ago, stay out of history for a minute, let's move ahead, it's time to move ahead. So they convinced me that's important, so we ca they came up with this. Uh, at a series of meetings uh, held not long ago, the Drake Group spent considerable time developing a fo the following vision for college sports in the future. In the future, number one, all college athletes will be fully integrated into diverse and inclusive campus communities and have the time and freedom to enjoy higher education's vibrant social and intellectual environment. And my comment on that is, when I played at football at Notre Dame, uh, there were no athletic dormitories, believe it or not. And as a result, I felt as a very integral part of the student body, discussions of politics, religion, race relations, and of course, next Saturday's football game were not uncommon. Is that not true? And uh, two of my friends from my dormitory are here, uh, Joel Maturi, and we have Larry Sealander. And these guys, I want to stand. 
Yeah, yeah. Tremendous friends for all these years. And no athlete, there were other athletes in the dormitory, but they were all mixed in. And that was really cool. And I'm not making, I'm not just making this up. Ask them afterward. We used to argue about these philosophy issues about we went, when I went to class. <laughs> I brought stuff, really interesting and important stuff back. And we would just go at it on that. Uh, Dudley Andrew was part of that too, and he couldn't make it here tonight. Uh, let's see. Yo, know, Larry is now at uh, Dwayne Morris, LLP, you know, did quite well in his life, and uh, Joel Maturi, athletic director at the University of Minnesota. Incredible uh, progress for you two guys, great friends. Number two in the future, the primary functions of college sports will be to provide extracurricular individual development opportunities to students and to contribute to the building of campus community and alumni fan relationships. That's a big vision, but I got it all in. Again, a comment by me. In the future, alumni athletic relations will be primarily based on shared pride in their college and university, not in NIL payments uh, from uh, wealthy alumni. Athletes will be an integral part of the student body, not professional entertainers. I think there are some places for NILs. I think we should discuss that in some detail. I think that it's a good way to compensate the athletes. It's better to compensate them that way than by payoffs under the table. But nonetheless, the main goal is as I stated. In the future, number three, all athletes who exhaust their collegiate eligibility will have a genuine opportunity to graduate with a meaningful educational degree. I fully uh, support the fairly recent U.S. Supreme Court ruling that allows schools to pr uh, provide financial compensation to athletes in the form of educational benefits, such as, many, such as money for, co for graduate school, vocational school, law school, money to finish undergraduate degrees requirements. I think that's a wonderful idea. That's compens I think college athletes should be compensated, but to compensate them in terms, of the, uh, in terms of educational incentives and so forth makes a wonderful, idea, uh, uh, a wonderful idea to me. So I like that legislation very much. By the way, I want to mention, when I played college football, I had a four-year scholarship that could not be withdrawn if I were a recruiting mistake. Recruiters came to my house, lots of them. I was recruited by like 100 different schools. They came to my house, and every time they came by, they said, they told my mom and dad, even if your, your son ends up being a recruiting mistake, but no, he's not going to, he's not going to. But if he does, he has his scholarship. I mean, that was really a, a cool thing. That was, I hate to use the term amateurism, but that was not employment. They're just saying, you have a four-year scholarship, and it is, it is guaranteed. And while we were out there, that happened to a couple of guys. They, they left uh, the team, but they still had their scholarships, which I think is terrific. Um, because scholarships today are one-year renewable scholarships, because these scholarships are one-year renewable, Athletes can be fired, thus making them employees who should be able to unionize. So I'm saying, you either have a one-year renewable scholarship, in which case you can fire the athletes, therefore they should be able to unionize, or you're giving them a four-year scholarship, which is a gift to help them further their education, and I would oppose unionization under those circumstances. No one's talked about that, but I think that's very damn important because you don't know what's happened in the history of the legislation of the NCAA. So I, I go two ways on this whole thing of unionization. If you want to turn the athletes into to, uh, to employees, as it appears many people in the country want to do today, get yourself ready for some very aggressive uh, unionization. But if you'd like to avoid unionization, go back to treating athletes as regular students in the student body and make the bring back the whole four-year scholarship thing so you can't be fired, you can't be fired. In the future, number four, college athletes will be free from educational and economic exploitation, including sex, race, and other forms of discrimination and physical and mental abuse. Now, all of these things that I'm reading with the numbers are the things that the Drake Group had sat down and made up these proposals, right? And then I'm kind of be labor 
uh, elaborated on them. They'll probably beat me up afterward for not checking through what I said in my interpretations, but nonetheless, I feel I'm old enough to do that and get away with it. Um, this is physical abuse. Physical and mental abuse by coaches, team physicians will be eliminated. The gap between resources available to male and female athletes will be closed. Police officers at Georgia will no longer stop a busload of female lacrosse players merely to harass them. That will never happen again. Now, can the universities change that? I don't know, but the, but the country as a whole has to move ahead. And universities, therefore, have to go along with the, with the, unit, with the, with the country as a whole. Too. And in the future, the Drake groups, and, uh, Drake groups Envisions a country free of racism and gender and sexism. All right, that's where we're, and I think we can help that happen through sports. In the future, number five, well, the cost of athletic programs will be appropriate for an extracurricular activity within a tax exempt not for profit organization or not for profit educational institution. That's very important. We forget that. I'll read it again. The cost of athletic programs will, will be in the future, will be appropriate for an extracurricular activity within a tax exempt nonprofit educational institution. What do I mean here? Someone mentioned this earlier today. Football coaches' salaries, $9 million a year for a football player, and a not for profit organization. Look, if you're in the pros, the pros make the money. They make money, it's a professional thing. The athletes are, in fact, employees. College athletes are not employees. They are not amateurs, but they're not employees. All right? By the way, amateurs, amateurs uh, don't get athletic scholarships. As soon as they start it, giving athletic scholarships in 1957, amateurism went out the window because now you're giving those athletes and paying those athletes money in return for their, their services, okay? Okay, I was going, football uh, coaches' salaries, $9 million a year or much more, or, or much more, will, not, uh, will be appropriate to an educational institution, will not be appropriate to an educational institution. The federal government has to look carefully at this. In the future, there will be no luxuries in the, in the athletic areas, living areas, facilities, uh, set aside uh, areas for, for our athletes. They're going to be integrated into the, to the total student body and at the same time uh, you know, be treated that way. And finally, I would say in the future, the corrosive aspects of commercialized college sports will be totally eliminated. And that's our dream and that is our vision in the Drake Group for, for the future. Whether we can do it, we'll see. Thank you.